The Case of Charles Dexter Ward by H. P. Lovecraft Read by Morgan Scorpion Chapter 5 A Nightmare and a Cataclysm Part 1 And now swiftly followed that hideous experience which has left its indelible mark of fear on the soul of Marinus Bicknell Willett, and has added a decade to the visible age of one whose youth was even then far behind. Dr. Willett had conferred at length with Mr. Ward, and had come to an agreement with him on several points which both felt the alienists would ridicule. There was, they conceded, a terrible movement alive in the world, whose direct connection with a necromancy even older than the Salem witchcraft could not be doubted. That at least two living men, and one other of whom they dared not think, were in absolute possession of minds or personalities which had functioned as early as 1690 or before, was likewise most unassailably proved even in the face of all known natural laws. What these horrible creatures, and Charles Ward as well, were doing or trying to do seemed fairly clear from their letters and from every bit of light, both old and new, which had filtered in upon the case. They were robbing the tombs of all the ages, including those of the world's wisest and greatest men, in the hope of recovering from the bygone ashes some vestige of the consciousness and law which had once animated and informed them. A hideous traffic was going on among these nightmare ghouls, whereby illustrious bones were bartered with the calm calculativeness of schoolboy swapping books, and from what was extorted from this century dust there was anticipated a power and a wisdom beyond anything which the cosmos had ever seen concentrated in one man or group. They had found unholy ways to keep their brains alive, either in the same body or different bodies, and had evidently achieved a way of tapping the consciousness of the dead whom they gathered together. There had, it seems, been some truth in the chimerical old Borellus when he wrote of preparing from even the most antique remains certain essential salts, from which the shade of a long dead living thing might be raised up. There was a formula for evoking such a shade, and another for putting it down, and it had now been so perfected that it could be taught successfully. One must be careful about evocations, for the markers of old graves are not always accurate. Willett and Mr. Ward shivered as they passed from conclusion to conclusion. Things, presences or voices of some sort, could be drawn down from unknown places as well as from the grave, and in this process also one must be careful. Joseph Cohen had indubitably evoked many forbidden things, and as for Charles, what might one think of him? What forces, outside the spheres, had reached him from Joseph Cohen's day, and turned his mind on forgotten things? He had been led to find certain directions, and he had used them. He had talked with the man of horror in Prague, and stayed long with the creature in the mountains of Transylvania, and he must have found the grave of Joseph Cohen at last. That newspaper item and what his mother had heard in the night were too significant to overlook. Then he had summoned something, and it must have come. That mighty voice aloft on Good Friday, and those different tones in the locked attic laboratory. What were they like with their depth and hollowness? Was there not here some awful foreshadowing of the dreaded stranger, Dr. Allen, with his spectral base? Yes, that was what Mr. Ward had felt with vague horror in his single talk with the man, if man it were, over the telephone. What hellish consciousness or voice, what morbid shade or presence, had come to answer Charles Ward's secret rites behind that locked door? Those voices heard in argument, must have it read for three months. Good God! Was not that just before the vampirism broke out? The rifling of Ezra Whedon's ancient grave, and the cries later at Portuxet, whose mind had planned the vengeance and rediscovered the shunned seat of elder blasphemies, and then the bungalow and the bearded stranger, and the gossip, and the fear. The final madness of Charles neither father nor doctor could attempt to explain, but they did feel sure that the mind of Joseph Cohen had come to earth again, and was following its ancient morbidities. Was demoniac possession in truth a possibility? Alan had something to do with it, and the detectives must find out more about one whose existence menaced the young man's life. In the meantime, since the existence of some vast crypt beneath the bungalow seemed virtually beyond dispute, some effort must be made to find it. 
Willett and Mr. Ward, conscious of the sceptical attitude of the alienists, resolved during their final conference to undertake a joint secret exploration of unparalleled thoroughness and agreed to meet at the bungalow on the following morning with valises and with certain tools and accessories suited to architectural search and underground exploration. The morning of April the 6th dawned clear, and both explorers were at the bungalow by ten o'clock. Mr. Ward had the key, and an entry and cursory survey were made. From the disordered condition of Dr. Allen's room it was obvious that the detectives had been there before, and the later searchers hoped that they had found some clue which might prove of value. Of course, the main business lay in the cellar, so thither they descended without much delay, again making the circuit which each had vainly made before in the presence of the mad young owner. For a time, everything seemed baffling. Each inch of the earthen floor and stone walls having so solid and innocuous an aspect that the thought of a yearning aperture was scarcely to be entertained. Willett reflected that since the original cellar was dug without knowledge of any catacombs beneath, the beginning of the passage would represent the strictly modern delving of young Ward and his associates, where they had probed for the ancient vaults whose rumour could have reached them by no wholesome means. The doctor tried to put himself in Charles's place, to see how a delver would be likely to start, but could not gain much inspiration from this method. Then he decided on elimination as a policy, and went carefully over the whole subterranean surface, both vertical and horizontal, trying to account for every inch separately. He was soon substantially narrowed down, and at last had nothing left but the small platform before the wash-tubs, which he tried once before in vain. Now experimenting in every possible way, and exerting a double strength, he finally found that the top did indeed turn and slide horizontally on a corner pivot. Beneath it lay a trim concrete surface with an iron manhole, to which Mr. Ward at once rushed with excited zeal. The cover was not hard to lift, and the father had quite removed it when Willett noticed the queerness of his aspect. He was swaying and nodding dizzily, and in the gust of noxious air which swept up from the black pit beneath, the doctor soon recognised ample cause. In a moment Dr. Willett had his fainting companion on the floor above and was reviving him with cold water. Mr. Ward responded feebly, but it could be seen that the mephitic blast from the crypt had in some way gravely sickened him. Wishing to take no chances, Willett hastened out to Broad Street for a taxicab, and had soon dispatched the sufferer home, despite his weak-voiced protests, after which he produced an electric torch, covered his nostrils with a band of sterile gauze, and descended once more to peer into the new-found depths. The foul air had now slightly abated, and Willett was able to send a beam of light down the Stygian hold. For about ten feet, he saw, it was a sheer cylindrical drop with concrete walls and an iron ladder, after which the hole appeared to strike a flight of old stone steps which must originally have emerged to earth somewhat southward of the present building. 2. Willett freely admits that for a moment the memory of the old Cohen legends kept him from climbing down alone into that malodorous gulf. He could not help thinking of what Luke Fenner had reported on that last monstrous night. Then duty asserted itself, and he made the plunge, carrying a great valise for the removal of whatever papers might prove of supreme importance. Slowly, as befitted one of his years, he descended the ladder and reached the slimy steps below. This was ancient masonry, his torch told him, and upon the dripping walls he saw the unwholesome moss of centuries. Down down round the steps, not spirally, but in three abrupt turns, and with such narrowness that two men could have passed only with difficulty. He had counted about thirty when a sound reached him very faintly, and after that he did not feel disposed to count any more. It was a godless sound, one of those low-keyed, insidious outrages of nature which are not meant to be. To call it a dull wail, a doom-dragged whine, or a hopeless howl of coarsed anguish and stricken flesh without mind, would be to miss its quintessential loathsomeness and soul-sickening overtones. Was it for this that Ward had seemed to listen on that day he was removed? 
It was the most shocking thing that Willett had ever heard, and it continued from no determinate point as the doctor reached the bottom of the steps and cast his torchlight around on lofty corridor walls, surmounted by cyclopean vaulting and pierced by numberless black archways. The hall in which he stood was perhaps fourteen feet high in the middle of the vaulting, and ten or twelve feet broad. Its pavement was of large chipped flagstones, and its walls and roof were of dressed masonry. Its length he could not imagine, for it stretched ahead indefinitely into the blackness. Of the archways, some had doors of the old six-panelled colonial type, whilst others had none. Overcoming the dread induced by the smell and the howling, Willett began to explore these archways one by one, finding beyond them rooms with groined stone ceilings, each of medium size and apparently of bizarre uses. Most of them had fireplaces, the upper course of whose chimneys would have formed an interesting study in engineering. Never before or since had he seen such instruments or suggestions of instruments as here loomed up on every hand through the burying dust and cobwebs of a century and a half, in many cases evidently shattered as if by the ancient raiders. For many of the chambers seemed wholly untrodden by modern feet, and must have represented the earliest and most obsolete phases of Joseph Cohen's experimentation. Finally there came a room of obvious modernity, or at least of recent occupancy. There were oil heaters, bookshelves and tables, chairs and cabinets, and a desk piled high with papers of varying antiquity and contemporaneousness. Candlesticks and oil lamps stood about in several places, and finding a match safe handy, will it lighted such as were ready for use. In the fuller gleam it appeared that this apartment was nothing less than the latest study or library of Charles Ward. Of the books the doctor had seen many before, and a good part of the furniture had plainly come from the Prospect Street mansion. Here and there was a piece well known to Willett, and the sense of familiarity became so great that he half forgot the noisomeness and the wailing, both of which were plainer here than they had been at the foot of the steps. His first duty, as planned long ahead, was to find and seize any papers which might seem of vital importance, especially those portentous documents found by Charles so long ago behind the picture in Olney Court. As he searched, he perceived how stupendous a task the final unravelling would be, for file on file was stuffed with papers in curious hands and bearing curious designs, so that months or even years might be needed for a thorough deciphering and editing. Once he found three large packets of letters with Prague and Rackus postmarks, and in writing clearly recognisable as Orne's and Hutchinson's, all of which he took with him as part of the bundle to be removed in his valise. At last, in a locked mahogany cabinet once gracing the ward home, Willett found the batch of old Kerwin papers, recognising them from the reluctant glimpse Charles had granted him so many years ago. The youth had evidently kept them together very much as they had been when first he found them, since all the titles recalled by the workmen were present except the papers addressed to Orne and Hutchinson, and the cipher with its key. Willett placed the entire lot in his valise, and continued his examination of the files. Since young Ward's immediate condition was the greatest matter at stake, the closest searching was done among the most obviously recent matter and in this abundance of contemporary manuscript one very baffling oddity was noted. The oddity was the slight amount in Charles's normal writing, which indeed included nothing more recent than two months before. On the other hand, there were literally reams of symbols and formulae, historical notes and philosophical comment, in a crabbed penmanship absolutely identical with the ancient script of Joseph Cohen, though of undeniably modern dating. Plainly, a part of the latter-day program had been a sedulous imitation of the old wizard's writing, which Charles seemed to have carried to a marvellous state of perfection. Of any third hand which might have been Alan's there was not a trace. If he had indeed come to be the leader, he must have forced young Ward to act as his amanuensis. In this new material one mystic formula, or rather pair of formulae, recurred so often that Willett had it by heart before he had half finished his quest. It consisted of two parallel columns, the left-hand one surmounted by the archaic symbol called Dragon's Head, and used in almanacs to indicate the ascending node, and the right-hand one headed by a corresponding sign of Dragon's Tail, or descending node. 
the appearance of the whole was something like this and almost unconsciously the doctor realized that the second half was no more than the first written syllabically backward with the exception of the final monosyllables and the odd name yogsathoth which he had come to recognize under various spellings from other things he had seen in connection with this horrible matter the formulae were as follows exactly so as will it is abundantly able to testify and the first one struck an odd note of uncomfortable latent memory in his brain which he recognized later when reviewing the events of that horrible good friday of the previous year yaingnga yogsothoth he il geb for i swadog wa ogswad eif gebel e yogsothoth nga nga ai swo so haunting were these formulae and so frequently did he come upon them that before the doctor knew it he was repeating them under his breath eventually however he felt he had secured all the papers he could digest to advantage for the present hence resolved to examine no more till he could bring the sceptical alienists en masse for an ampler and more systematic raid he had still to find the hidden laboratory so leaving his valise in the lighted room he emerged again into the black noisome corridor whose vaulting echoed ceaseless with that dull and hideous whine the next few rooms he tried were all abandoned or filled only with crumbling boxes and ominous-looking leaden coffins but impressed him deeply with the magnitude of joseph kerwin's original operations he thought of the slaves and seamen who had disappeared of the graves which had been violated in every part of the world and of what that final raiding party must have seen and then he decided it was better not to think any more once a great stone staircase mounted at his right and he deduced that this must have reached to one of the cohen outbuildings perhaps the famous stone edifice with the high slit-like windows provided the steps he had descended had led from the steep roofed farmhouse suddenly the walls seemed to fall away ahead and the stench and the wailing grew stronger Willett saw that he had come upon a vast open space, so great that his torchlight would not carry across it, and as he advanced he encountered occasional stout pillars supporting the arches of the roof. After a time he reached a circle of pillars grouped like the monoliths of Stonehenge, with a large carved altar on a base of three steps in the centre, and so curious were the carvings on that altar that he approached to study them with his electric light. But when he saw what they were, he shrank away shuddering, and did not stop to investigate the dark stains which discoloured the upper surface, and had spread down the sides in occasional thin lines. Instead, he found the distant wall, and traced it, as it swept round in a gigantic circle, perforated by occasional black doorways, and indented by a myriad of shallow cells with iron gratings, and wrist and ankle bones on chains, fastened to the stone of the concave rear masonry. These cells were empty, but still the horrible odour and the dismal moaning continued more insistent now than ever and seemingly varied at time by a sort of slippery thumping three from that frightful smell and that uncanny noise willett's attention could no longer be diverted both were plainer and more hideous in the great pillared hall than anywhere else and carried a vague impression of being far below, even in this dark nether world of subterranean mystery. Before trying any of the black archways for steps leading further down, the doctor cast his beam of light about the stone-flagged floor. It was very loosely paved, and at irregular intervals there would occur a slab curiously pierced by small holes in no definite arrangement, while at one point there lay a very long ladder carelessly flung down. To this ladder, singularly enough, appeared to cling a particularly large amount of the frightful odour which encompassed everything. As he walked slowly about, it suddenly occurred to Willett that both the noise and the odour seemed strongest above the oddly pierced slabs, as if they might be crude trap-doors leading down to some still deeper region of horror. Kneeling by one, he worked at it with his hands, and found that with extreme difficulty he could budge it. At his touch the moaning beneath ascended to a louder key, and only with vast trepidation did he persevere in the lifting of the heavy stone. A stench unnameable now rose up from below, 
and the doctor's head reeled dizzily as he laid back the slab and turned his torch upon the exposed square yard of gaping blackness if he had expected a flight of steps to some wide gulf of ultimate abomination well it was destined to be disappointed for amidst that fetor and cracked whining he discerned only the brick-faced top of a cylindrical well perhaps a yard and a half in diameter and devoid of any ladder or other means of descent as the light shone down the wailing changed suddenly to a series of horrible yelps in conjunction with which there came again that sound of blind futile scrambling and slippery thumping the explorer trembled unwilling even to imagine what noxious thing might be lurking in that abyss but in a moment mustered up the courage to peer over the rough-hewn brink lying at full length and holding the torch downward at arm's length to see what might lie below for a second he could distinguish nothing but the slimy moss-grown brick walls sinking illimitably into that half-tangible miasma of murk and foulness and anguished frenzy and then he saw that something dark was leaping clumsily and frantically up and down at the bottom of the narrow shaft which must have been from twenty to twenty-five feet below the stone floor where he lay the torch shook in his hand but he looked again to see what manner of living creature might be immured there in the darkness of that unnatural well left starving by young ward through all the long months since the doctors had taken him away and clearly only one of a vast number prisoned in the kindred wells whose pierced stone covers so thickly studded the floor of the great vaulted cavern whatever the things were they could not lie down in their cramped spaces but must have crouched and whined and waited and feebly leaped all those hideous weeks since their master had abandoned them unheeded but marinus bicknell willett was sorry that he looked again for surgeon and veteran of the dissecting room though he was he has not been the same since it is hard to explain just how a single sight of a tangible object with measurable dimensions could so shake and change a man and we may only say that there is about certain outlines and entities a power of symbolism and suggestion which acts frightfully on a sensitive thinker's perspective and whispers terrible hints of obscure cosmic relationships and unnameable realities behind the protective illusions of common vision in that second look will it saw such an outline or entity for during the next few instants he was undoubtedly as stark raving mad as any inmate of dr waite's private hospital he dropped the electric torch from a hand drained of muscular power or nervous coordination nor heeded the sound of crunching teeth which told of its fate at the bottom of the pit he screamed and screamed and screamed in a voice whose falsetto panic no acquaintance of his would ever have recognized and though he could not rise to his feet he crawled and rolled desperately away from the damp pavement where dozens of tartarian wells poured forth their exhausted whining and yelping to answer his own insane cries he tore his hands on the rough loose stones and many times bruised his head against the frequent pillars but still he kept on then at last he slowly came to himself in the utter blackness and stench and stopped his ears against the droning wail into which the burst of yelping had subsided he was drenched with perspiration and without means of producing a light stricken and unnerved in the abysmal blackness and horror and crushed with a memory he could never efface beneath him dozens of those things still lived and from one of those shafts the cover was removed he knew that what he had seen could never climb up the slippery walls yet shuddered at the thought that some obscure foothold might exist what the thing was he would never tell it was like some of the carvings on the hellish altar but it was alive nature had never made it in this form for it was too palpably unfinished the deficiencies were of the most surprising sort and the abnormalities of proportion could not be described will it consents only to say that this type of thing must have represented entities which ward called up from imperfect salts and which he kept for servile or ritualistic purposes if it had not had a certain significance its image would not have been carved on that damnable stone it was not the worst thing depicted on that stone but will it never open the other pits at the time 
the first connected idea in his mind was an idle paragraph from some of the old Kerwin data he had digested long before, a phrase used by Simon or Jedediah Orne in that portentous confiscated letter to the bygone sorcerer. Certainly there was nothing but ye liveliest awfulness in that which H. raised up from what he could gather only a part of. Then, horribly supplementing rather than displacing this image, there came a recollection of those ancient lingering rumours anent the burned, twisted thing found in the fields a week after the Kerwin raid. Charles Ward had once told the doctor what old Slocum said of that object, that it was neither thoroughly human nor wholly allied to any animal which Portuxet folk had ever seen or read about. These words hummed in the doctor's mind as he rocked to and fro, squatting on the nitrous stone floor. He tried to drive them out, and repeated the Lord's Prayer to himself, eventually trailing off into a mnemonic hodgepodge like the modernistic wasteland of Mr. T. S. Eliot, and finally reverting to the oft-repeated dual formula he had lately found in Ward's underground library. Yai ng nga yog sothoth, and so on, till the final underlined zwo. It seemed to soothe him, and he staggered to his feet after a time, lamenting bitterly his fright-lost torch, and looking wildly about for any gleam of light in the clutching inkiness of the chilly air. Think he would not, but he strained his eyes in every direction for some faint glint or reflection of the bright illumination he had left in the library. After a while he thought he detected a suspicion of a glow infinitely far away, and toward this he crawled, in agonized caution on hands and knees, amidst the stench and howling, always feeling ahead lest he collide with the numerous great pillars, or stumble into the abominable pit he had uncovered. Once his shaking fingers touched something which he knew must be the steps leading to the hellish altar, and from this spot he recoiled in horror. At another time he encountered the pierced slab he had removed, and here his caution became almost pitiful. But he did not come upon the dread aperture after all, nor did anything issue from that aperture to detain him. What had been down there made no sound nor stir. Evidently its crunching of the fallen electric torch had not been good for it. Each time with its fingers felt a perforated slab he trembled. His passage over it would sometimes increase the groaning below, but generally it would produce no effect at all, since he moved very noiselessly. Several times during his progress the glow ahead diminished perceptibly, and he realized that the various candles and lamps he had left must be expiring one by one. The thought of being lost in utter darkness without matches amidst this underground world of nightmare labyrinths impaled him to rise to his feet and run, which he could safely do now that he had passed the open pit, for he knew that once the light failed his only hope of rescue and survival would lie in whatever relief party Mr. Ward might send after missing him for a sufficient period. Presently, however, he emerged from the open space into the narrower corridor and definitely located the glow as coming from a door on his right. In a moment he had reached it and was standing once more in young Ward's secret library, trembling with relief and watching the sputterings of that last lamp which had brought him to safety.' 